Is this actually, yes, it seems to be working now. <laughs> Maybe this will hold it close enough. It's hard to be sure. So I'd like to talk about some of the good things that are happening in the free software movement before I get to the gigantic list of the horrible things. One good thing is that progress is being made towards uh, a portable phone, also known as Stalin's dream device, that wouldn't be as horrible as they usually are. Uh, basically, the, the non-free software in the modem processor, the one that actually talks over the radio to the phone network, uh, has a back door. But it's possible to neutralize this back door so it can't listen to the microphone and transmit it by designing the phone for protection of the user's privacy. And uh, it's at the circuit level. Uh, there's a switch to, t you know, you can stop it from hearing the microphone, you can stop it from transmitting, and this doesn't depend on any software or anything that could be easily ruined. And the only remaining horrible thing is that the phone network tracks the movements of the phone. I have an idea that might make it acceptable, and that is keep the phone's radio off most of the time and carry a one-way pager so people can say that they want to talk to you. And then when someone pages you, it will say why, who and why, and you can decide how urgent that is and when to reveal your location to Purr and to, the, to Big Brother by turning the radio on. And so if it's not urgent, you might wait till you're in a place that's not sensitive before you turn it on. Uh, we, have, we may be able to arrange a free e-reader. I'd like to have one. I have e-books, but I almost never read them because if it's a place where I can use my computer, I do my work instead. There's always plenty of that. So uh, maybe if I could have a free software e-reader, I could read e-books in places where I couldn't use my computer, like where I'm standing up. Uh, so we haven't decided yet whether to do this that decision will be made by the FSF soon, I hope. Uh, and we see free software expanding into areas such as graphic design and music and medicine, where uh, it looked like it was, uh, oh, and CAD systems. Uh, so areas which look very, very far away, we're now approaching. So what are some of the bad things? One very bad thing is that schools in the US are turning into monsters for imposing proprietary software and massive surveillance on their students. Now, there's a law, uh, a, US, a federal law, that requires students to maintain the privacy of student data, and they found an absurd excuse to throw that away completely. They appoint some corporation, giant corporation like Google or Microsoft or Apple as, quote, an officer of the school, unquote, which means it's allowed to look at the student's data. I wonder how many millions of schools those companies are officers of, supposedly. But this is absolute bullshit. Uh, if the school tells a company even the student's name, it is violating that student's privacy. So what we need to do is organize both students and parents to fight back against this by refusing and saying, don't spy on me. Of course, 
that implies don't give me non-free software because nowadays non-free software generally spies and generally does other nasty things as well. Non-free software is generally malware. But when schools create an email account in some company and give it to the student and say, from now on, we're going to send you mail about your coursework through that account, well, that is violating per privacy. It must stop. So I'm hoping that we will be able to come up with a way to organize a campaign about this. I don't think the first steps will uh, bring us a victory, but what they may do, if we do it well, is make it an issue that schools are helping companies spy on their students. Make it something that's politically difficult for schools. Now, we see more and more things that pe where people are basically pressured or required to run non-free software, and some where it might happen. For instance, the European Union is going to require, or actually I think the, the Schengen zone maybe only, is going to require US citizens to use a certain website to enter data to get permission to go there. Well, how will that website be designed? Will it require running non-free software? Nowadays, many websites require users to run non-free software. It's non-free JavaScript code that's in the pages of the site. The site sends it to the user, and then either you give up your freedom by writing it, by running it, or you don't use the site, or you work out some workaround. One workaround is replace the JavaScript with free software. And I hope that we will soon engage someone to start writing replacement JavaScript for non-trivial sites and start showing it is possible to escape from those problems. But uh, it turns out that uh, from what I've heard, well, there is a giant problem of surveillance because uh, many non-free programs spy on users, many online disk services collect data about users, and not because they couldn't function without it, but because lots of entities want to collect data about people. So uh, we recently saw uh, Senator Warren proposed to try to stop some of this by breaking up the biggest data collecting companies. Well, it's a big advance to see uh, important politicians recognizing that the surveillance is dangerous. But this remedy will not solve the problem. If we look at the surveillance, uh, is that actually visible up there? Well. Here's all the surveillance. It's actually divided among various companies. But there are ways to virtually combine the databases in order to use them together, even without actually merging them. And in addition, the data typically gets sold to data brokers, which means here's what the data broker gets. And then the FBI under the Unjust Pat Riot Act, can take all of the data from all of these companies and put it together, just like the data brokers. Or they could just take it all from the data brokers, pre-re-identified. And uh, so what happens if you break up a few of the biggest companies? Then you get this. But it's still the same surveillance. It doesn't really change anything much. It doesn't really matter how the data that's being collected is subdivided into various companies. 
if we don't want a total surveillance society, we have to stop them from collecting data. Therefore, we need a law requiring systems to be designed so that they don't collect data. In, with some specific exceptions, you know, it's, I think it's reasonable to know who owns each building in the city to require the deeds to be registered and so on. I think that's legitimate. I won't object to that. I think it's reasonable to check the passports of people who enter your country. I'm not going to object to that. But outside of data that for some reason should be collected, and that should be the exception, it should be prohibited to collect data about people and what they're doing and centralize it. Now, if it's kept in a very decentralized way so that physically accessing it all becomes a limiting factor, then it becomes safe. It might give us some security, but it doesn't threaten us with a massive surveillance society uh, like China. And China is what we have to remember. That's what we're trying to avoid. We have to have systems designed so that they don't deliver us to China. And uh, the way to do that is to require systems not to be designed so that they uh, collect massive databases that are easy to look in for information about any particular person. Now, among the uh, devices that do this, that spy on people, we see a tremendous increase due to the internet of, of uh, spies. I sometimes call it the internet of stings because it does worse than just spy. It cheats people, it manipulates people. Uh, you ask it, oh, where can I get a pizza? And it will tell you the place that paid to be given as the answer. Uh, and not mention that there are others. Uh, but spying is the horrible thing. Basically, anything they do, they report. And uh, I recently read that uh, Google wanted to have a requirement for all the products you could tell its uh, personal assistants to operate. Basically, all those products would be required to send everything that's done with them to Google. So if you set it up so that the Google Assistant could turn that light on and off, then that light would have to send to Google every time it's turned on and off, even by other methods. This was a plan. Google was going to demand this. Uh, whether it will still do so now that people have heard about it, I don't know. But the point is, what we're seeing the development of large conspiracies of companies making various products work together to spy on people. And yesterday, I got word, uh, at this point I can't consider it established, it may or may not be true, but the report said that version three of reCAPTCHA is designed to make many websites cooperate in tracking people's browsing and that sites may not let you in unless you've been browsing in lots of sites in a way that doesn't protect you. Running the JavaScript, uh, not going through Tor so that you, basically, the, the requirement to get into these sites is that you do lots of browsing they can spy on. This would be a massive conspiracy to pressure people into being spied on in many of their activities. <clears throat> I'm hope, I asked this morning, can anyone help me get information? No one came up to me. I still don't know any more than I knew last night, but uh, I hope I will get information soon. If this is really as it's been described, it's horrible. And uh, by the way, <clears throat> 
the personal assistants, the things that listen to everything in your home, those are the nastiest of all these uh, tethered and uh, spying products. I have a friend who has a listening device in his home. I no longer speak when I'm there. <laughs> if he speaks to me, I point at the door. <laughs> yeah, let's go out there. I mean, of course, it's ridiculous. It's ha-ha only serious. Because if we say each time somebody else is arranged spying on us, oh well, probably it's not really going to hurt me, we'll teach ourselves to accept them. So we need to do these ridiculous things to show that we really object. That, you know, if they really want to be spied on all the time, we can't stop them. But they shouldn't be imposing this on their friends. Friends don't let companies spy on friends. <clears throat> Bruce Schneier told us that we're going to have to trust to use these devices, we'll have to trust every program developer, the developer of every program in the device, or they'll be insecure and they'll be taken over. And then in addition to the manufacturers using it against us, crackers would use it against us as well. Well, that's not always true. That's true if the software is proprietary. But when, there's, when it's free software, there's more than just the developer for you to place your trust in. You have a community of users as well. And even so, you know, you're, you have more of a reason to trust the whole community of users than trust one developer who doesn't have your interests at heart. So free software helps solve that problem. It gives us, it doesn't automatically make the problem of security go away, but it gives us a hope of solving that problem. And free software is the only hope we get. And finally, we need the strength to resist. In the previous panel, which is about a very dangerous Australian law that seems to be available to require any developer to sabotage per software on command from Australia, well, that law also forbids people to put up statements saying, Australia has not yet ordered me to sabotage my software. But someone pointed out if people outside Australia were to do this, and if many of them did this, it's not that easy for Australia to try to grab someone who doesn't live there, doesn't go there, and so on. And one could imagine that the pro this practice would become so widespread that Australia would realize that if it tried to fight people who were doing this, it would have a messy consequence and it would not like that. So that is uh, an idea that came up. So uh, at this point, it's time to give the free software awards. Well the Free Software Award and the Social Benefit Award. So first comes the Free Software Award, which goes to Deb Nicholson, who's been in our community for ages. It looks different this year. So Deb has been involved in the development of GNU Media Goblin, in, but is especially involved in building up the community. Uh, she's also helped start Libra Planet, 
I was told it was your idea to invite more than FSF members and make this what it is. You're welcome. I'm sorry to the staff. I know it's a lot more work. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we have more staff now, too. <laughs> Maybe oh, that's because of you. Is, does this disk really contain any kind of data? Yes. Oh. Oh. So, so we don't know what it has on it. <laughs> Guess you'll have to find some obsolete hardware in order to find out. We have a record player. Oh, uh, this is this uh, is this a laser disc or no? This is a thirty. It's this a is just an audio record. I see. Yeah. Oh well, I guess it won't be that hard. I'll let you know. If you don't have a turntable, you could use mine. We have a turntable. Um, is this where I'm supposed to? Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, this is such an honor. I'm really excited to be here. And, um, and, uh, and I'm glad to see the work to do, uh, welcoming into the community, getting recognition. Um, I find it very rewarding to do that kind of work. And, uh, I think we can't build a free software movement that doesn't bring in new people, doesn't bring in people from underrepresented groups, doesn't bring in, you know, all of the, the folks that are not here yet in the room. And so, uh, if you were wondering, is that work super fun? It is, and there are a lot of us. So I hope that you will find a way to incorporate that into your own activism. Thank you. And now the award for social, for applying free software or its principles for social benefit goes to OpenStreetMap. Now, it was clear Once free software started having some success, it was clear we, that there were other kinds of collections of information that we needed to have in the free world. So like, for instance, uh, encyclopedias, dictionaries, uh, and maps. <laughs> because uh, the same reasons apply. So. Uh, occasionally I would mention we need to have uh, free street maps free, that we can use. And uh, fortunately, people started one. I wish they would call it free, you know, <laughs> uh, because open doesn't mean the same thing. Uh, but it is free, and it's making our world freer. everyone. I'm Kate Chapman. I'm the chairperson of the OpenStreetMap Foundation, uh, and I'm also a mapper. So this is really for our entire community, everyone who's contributed a single point of interest, a road, software. You know, free software and free maps go hand in hand, and we wouldn't be where we are today without, without both of them. So thank you very much. <laughs> I think I'm finished. <laughs>